Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I start, I want to apologize for my English. I normally don't have a very big problem with English, but this is being recorded. And I just know that my, wi my wife is English. So I just know that she's going to look through this uh, talk and find any mistake that, I, that I'll do and just pinpoint them, each one, uh, for me and laugh at me for the rest of my life about it. So it's quite stressful. Um, so please bear with me. What I'm going to talk about today is the C++ memory model. Now, I don't normally like agenda slides because instead of just talking about what I'm going to talk about, why well, I want to just talk about it. But in this case, the C and C++ memory model is quite a large topic, so I wanted to frame everything that I'm going to talk about and just to set our expectations right. So the first part is going to be quite boring. It's just some obligatory theory that we need to cover in order to really understand what's a memory model and why do we need it. To give a comprehensive explanation about it will take me probably a few hours. So I'm not going to. I'm just going to give a very, very fast overview. What I'm actually trying to say here is that I'm going to lie a bit, and I'm going to bend some corners, hopefully not too much. The idea is just to give the gist, to give the idea of why we need it, and what, what, what's the, why do we need it, and why do you like it. The second part is going to be some consequences of it, which I think is really cool. We'll see some applications that do not behave the way that we expect them to behave. We'll understand why and how we can fix them. Then the third part is going to be some applications. Yeah? Some applications basically means how we can uh, write our code to take better utilization of our hardware while maintaining correctness. If time permits, I divide it into two parts. The last part is going to be a bit, a small touch about uh, at atomics with uh, sequentially consistent and non sequentially consistent memory orders. I'm not sure we'll get to it, but we'll see how we. We're going on. The first part, go back to the first part. I want to go very fast on it, so I even summarized all of the, this part with one slide, that that slide is the only really important stuff. That's the only thing that you need to understand in order to um, understand the rest of the, of the presentation. Yes. Better? OK. Uh, so I summarized everything in the last, uh, in one last slide. So what I'm trying to say here is, unless you really, really have to ask in this part, let's leave it to the end. The last slide is the only really important one. So let's start with the boring uh, theory. When we write a program, that's the memory model of the computer that we have in our mind. We tend to believe that we have one CPU and a large chunk of real large data. We also tend to believe that the compilers just translate our code into machine code, and that the CPU runs the program that, that we wrote, or that the compiler translated. And if we'll go back 30, 40 years ago, that was very close to reality, and life was very, very simple at the time. But life was also very, very slow. And then came Gordon Moore, that we all know from Moore's Law. And what, Moore law, what Moore's Law says is that the density of a transistor in an integrated circuit doubles itself every two years, which basically means that CPU becomes much, much faster and very, very fast. Unfortunately, the memory did not advance so much and so fast. So what we see on the diagram on the left is the gap that started to, be, to build between the speed of the CPU and the speed of the memory. So if each instruction takes one tick to execute, and each memory fetch takes 200 cycles, remember we have only one memory. So if every instruction calls even one to the main memory, which is a fair assumption, it needs to fetch the instruction, it needs to fetch the operand. So even if it calls even once, it means that the CPU would halt waiting for data for 99.5% of, of the time. 
So what we'd really like is a large amount of very, very fast memory. But unfortunately, that's not possible. First of all, it's very expensive to produce a very, very fast memory. Second is this small thing that we as uh, software developers tend to ignore physics, you know. It's not very possible to make such a large amount of very, very fast memory. So instead, we have memory hierarchies. The memory is divided into sections, into hierarchies. And the higher the memory, the higher the hierarchy is, the faster the memory is, but also the smaller it is. So L1 is very, very fast. It takes like two to four cycles to fetch memory from L1, but we only have 32 Ks of cache. If we go to the other extreme, the main memory takes 100 cycles, 100 to 200 cycles, but we have a very large amount of it. So the actual computer that we actually program for looks a bit more like this. This is not to scale, but that's how it looks more. We have a lot of many layers of uh, caches. We have the store buffer. And it also implies that the compiler change our code. We'll talk about this later. And the CPU runs not the program that we wrote, or not in the order that we wrote it, but in the order that it's find most efficient. We'll talk about this also later. But I said that the memory is very, very slow. And I gave you some numbers, but I don't think that you can really comprehend by numbers just how slow it is. So this one is to scale. Just that how, that, this is just how slow fetching memory for main memory is. Yes, it's still on the way. While we are at it, while we're waiting for the memory to arrive, this period that we're waiting for the memory, most profilers will show it as CPU busy. So if you see that the CPU is at 100%, it could be that it's 99% of the time it's just waiting for memory, and only 1% of the time it's doing actual progress. Well, I got bored of waiting for it, and I hope that you have too, so let's skip it. What are our requirements from the cache? Well, first of all, we obviously want the swapping in and out to be extremely efficient. We don't just want to wait till memory will be swapped into the cache or swapped out of the cache. In order to do this, we need to maintain the maintenance time of the cache. We want the cache to be non-consecutive. As we saw, some of the cache is shared between different cores. Different cores run different applications. They obviously need uh, different parts of the memory, but even in the same core, we want to access different segments of data, the heap, the stack, the instructions. So we need to have random access uh, cache. But we do want some locality, because if, if, if we attach byte number four, the number five, it's very likely that we'll want also six and seven. So in order to achieve this, the memory is divided into cache lines. Cache line is a fixed, a fixed block of, of memory. And that's the smallest cacheable unit. We cannot cache anything smaller than a cache line. Whenever we want any, any memory, the whole cache line have to, have to be swapped in. So if I want this bit marked with X, the whole cache line is going to be swapped into the memory. We, want, we don't want the cache line to be too small, because we do want some locality. But we don't, also don't want it to be too big because then swapping it in and out would be just too slow, and we'll have a lot of wasted memory. If you want a memory four and five, maybe you want six and seven, but it's a bit less like that. We want 25 and 27, or 105 and 107. The other requirement that we have from the cache is searching the cache should be really fast. We don't want to take forever to find, just check if the cache is there. O of n scanning the whole cache is totally unacceptable. So the cache is divided into, the cache line is divided into sections. So what we see here on the main memory is just cache lines. Every cache line has its own color, and the cache is divided into sections. So if I want this yellow cache line, it can fit into each one, and only into each one of these yellow sections. So let's say, it's went into this section. When I want this yellow cache line, again, it can go into each one of the yellow cache line. It can go into this one, for example. But then when I want to search for it, I just need to search those three uh, yellow sections. So the lookup is much, much faster. 
Now, as I mentioned, the compiler has some freedom. The compiler can rearrange our code. It can add and remove memory access. I think we all saw it when we debug in with some optimization and we try to print value. Many times it tells us that this uh, argument has been optimized out. It can also rearrange the side. When we, all, when we go with the debugger, we can see that uh, the cursor just moves up and down. It can reuse location, so if I have a function that in the first part of it I'm using foo, and in the other part I'm not using foo anymore but using bar, it can use the same location. Now, the reason that compiler and vendor do it, I believe, is that they really, really hate us. They just want to make our life that much harder. What they claim is that it allows them to emit code that will take much better usage from the hardware. In particular, it allows them to, use, to provide better locality and this way to use the amount of stale cycle. The only restriction that they have is that they have to maintain the, the observable state of our application, but from a single thread point of view. So what we see here, that's a C++ talk, so we have to have a screenshot from Compiler Explorer. So here it is. What we see here is a very simple uh, producer. We just want to publish the message, so we set publish message to row message, we then null the row message and mark a flag with one. What we see that when, we when we compile it with uh, O2 is that the first uh, instruction that the compiler emits is setting the flag. The compiler is allowed to do it because no one sees this intermediate stage when we talk about single threaded. The, the outcome of this, of this function is the same. And that's fine from a single thread point of view. Obviously, when we start to talk about multi-threading, that's totally unacceptable. So something that comes to mind to a lot of people is to use Volatile. Now, Volatile was introduced into C and then from C to C++ in order to support memory mapped I.O. In order to provide support for memory mapped I.O., reordering or deleting Volatile instruction is forbidden. If I'm reading from a memory map I.O., I can't just, the compiler cannot just say, no, you're not gonna, not gonna use it. You don't need it. If I'm writing there, I need to write there. It can't decide that, that I don't want it. The same way if I'm writing, the order in which I'm writing is important. So the compiler is not allowed to reorder a volatile operation. However, it, that it is allowed to reorder volatiles with non-volatiles operations. So if you want to use volatile in order to prevent reordering, we need to mark all the variables as volatile. Now, we, the example that I just showed, it's very simple. We have the, just three variables. But if you're talking about real code, we'll need, it's much, much harder. And in addition to that, every access to this variable from now on would be subjected to the same restriction. We can't just forbid it in one place and not from other places. So that's not a very good solution. C++11 uh, uh, provided us with compiler barriers. Compiler barrier is just like a fence. Whatever before this fence has to stay before the fence, and whatever below this fence has to stay below this fence. Compiler barriers are uh, emitted implicitly for every function that has compiler barrier. I, actually, for most functions, inline functions and stuff like that do not emit the uh, compiler barrier, but most functions do. Uh, Non-relaxed atomic also provided. So what we see here, I put a barrier and everything is fine. Now if you think that that's kind of annoying because we look at the code and it looks correct, we need to look at the assembly in order to see the code, that's the easy part because the freedom has freedom too. When we think about what computer, what the CPU does, our mental model is it takes an instruction, decode it, fetch the operands, execute it, and write the result. Then execute, then takes the next one, brings the operand, execute it, and write it. That's not really what happens in a modern CPU. It's more like we fetch the instruction, and then we push it to the instruction queue. We wait for the operands to arrive. When we have the operands, 
we dispatch it to the relevant execution unit. Now, because we can, maybe the operands for one instruction are inside in the cache, but for the previous one, we need to bring from uh, main memory, we may have the operands for one instruction, for the second instructions before we have the one for the previous one. We will still execute the, the second one before. Then we write the result to a result queue, and then when the time comes when all the previous instructions have been read from this queue, we'll write the result for, uh, to the register file. So what it means is that the CPU is not uh, uh, executing our instruction in the order that we wrote it, it's, execu it's executing the instruction in the data availability order, and only then it reorder it back to the original uh, order. So it, it reduces the amount of uh, wait time, and it also allows us to use several uh, functional units at the same time, which we we're not able to do in the previous uh, execution model. But it also means that the instruction of being reordered. So if you look at this, this is a simple uh, producer-consumer. We see that we have one core just publish an answer, 42, and then mark a flag with one. The the consumer waits for the flag to be set and then just prints the answer. But as we said, the CPU may uh, reorder it. So the CPU may write finished before answer is written. It also may read answer, the second core may read answer before it reads uh, finished equals one. Obviously, we're talking, we're talking about CPU reordering, so using volatile, volatile is a compiler instruction, so it has no effect on this. Compiler barrier also will have no effect on this. So what we have is we have several threads that need to talk to each other. They talk to each other by sharing their state, by sharing data. But several instructions are being executed in parallel. In order to be able to reason about sharing data, we need to be able to reason about the order of reads and writes. And that's where the memory model comes. Memory model defines the restrictions of reorderings. If you're allowed to reorder load with load, load with store, and so on. Until C++ 11, C and C++ did not have a memory model. So we couldn't really reason about it. We couldn't write a portable multi-threaded applications complying to the standard. C++ 11 fixed it. The way that it fixed it is with memory fences. Now, for this talk, I'm not going to distinguish between atomics operation with non-relaxed memory orders to standalone fences. They do have some differences, but for this talk, I'm not going to talk about it. If you want, you can uh, talk to me offline. So what memory orders provide is some ordering with, with respect to memory access. And when we have it, when we when the language requires a memory fence, the toolchain will have to support the memory fence for this architecture. And if such fence is not available, it will have to issue a stronger one. We can divide the memory fence into two sections, full memory barriers, which basically means whatever before this fence has to be executed and visible before the fence, and whatever, what's behind it has to stay behind it and one-way fences, which is acquire release, which means that operations are allowed to go in one direction, but not in the other, or certain operations allowed to go in one direction, and some are not, and no operation can go in the other direction. So if you look at this example, we set the answer to be 42, and then Finish is now atomic operation and we store it with memory acquire with memory order release. When we read it, we read it with memory order acquire. Answer equals 42 is in the same core as the store of finish. So it's sequence before that. If it's sequence before that in the same uh, core, it has to happen before that. Same goes to reading finished and reading answer. 
Now, these two memory uh, fences provide a relation of synchronized with. So they acquire synchronized with the release, and they provide happens before relationship. And that's why, the, and this way, I can make sure that if I'm reading one on the finish, I will see out the 42. C++ is SCDRF, sequentially consistent data race free. Sequentially consistent basically means there's a lot of words in these slides, so it hints you that you shouldn't really read it. What sequentially consistent means is that the program that we wrote is the program that will execute, that would be executed, more or less. Data rates means simultaneously accessing the uh, memory address or simultaneously accessing a memory from two or more threads when at least one of them is a writer. Simultaneously means with no uh, happens before ordering. What all this tries to say is that if we make sure we don't write a data race, we can pretend that our application is run sequentially consistent. So let's look at this, why, why it's important. If you start to try to reason about all these fences, that's very hard to, to reason about this code. It's very, very simple. We have data equals 42, and then first flag we store one to, make, to signal to other threads that it's ready. The second thread, if, it, if, this, if T1 is set to one, just stores T2 into one as well. Assuming that T1 and T2 are initialized to zero. So if the third thread, see that T1, that, that, sorry, that T2 is set to one, data has to be set to 42. That condition would all, always be true. Now trying to reason about it with fences is a bit hard, but I think it's much easier to see that we don't have a data race here. So it has to be sequentially consistent. That's the guarantee that we have from the standard. So I think it's much, much easier to reason about it this way, just to make sure we don't have any data races, and then we're sequentially consistent. Now for the final slide that, if you understand it, you understand everything else uh, for this talk. Memory is divided into cache line, and cache line is the smallest cacheable unit. Every cache line can fit into a small subset of cache slots. The compiler can change the, way, the code that we write. The CPU can execute in a different order. C++ is sequentially consistent data race free, and we use fences in order to restrict the ordering that the tool chain and the CPU are allowed to make. So let's talk about some consequences. Are there any questions so far? Great. The first example is just to show a CPU reordering. I saw it first time in Jeff Pressing's blog, pressing.com, and it's an excellent blog, so I'm very happy to give the credit. Since I saw it in many, many other places, but that was the first one, so credit goes to him. We have two threads. The first thread sets X to Y. We assume that X, Y, R, X, and R, Y are all uh, initialized to zero. Thread one puts X equals one, and then R, Y equals Y. The other thread put one into one, and then Rx into x. Take a couple of seconds just to convince yourself that there is no ordering of threads. Both Ry and Rx can be zero. One of them has to be first. Let's say that thread one goes first, then x equals one, and then the second thread has to see one. Same goes the other way around. Now we want to run it many times and we want to run it very fast. So obviously spawning threads every time is not really possible. So what we'll do is this. The main thread will initialize all the semaphores and spawn two threads. And then forever initialize all the four variables into zero and post signal to the two threads that they can start working. Then it will wait for the threads to signal to, to it that they finish and then it will check if both Rx and Ry are zero, and it will print an appropriate message. 
What each one of these threads will do, it will wait to be signaled that it started, do its assignments, and then post that it finished. Between the two assignments, I place the compiler barrier just to make sure uh, that the compiler emits the code that we want it to emit. If we run it in x86, that's what we'll see. Now, x86 is very, very strongly ordered. It's not allowed to make almost any reordering, but still, we that instruction reordering happened. But you know how to resolve it. We just place a memory fence between the two operations. A demonstrating this would be kind of boring. That's resolved the issue. Another way to resolve it, we said that the same core would always see its operation in the order it's written. So if we know that our code is going to run in the same core, we don't need to worry about it. The same core will never see its data out of order. So in this case, setting affinity just for this may be a huge overkill. But if we know that it's going to run in the same core, we don't need to worry about it. The next thing I want to show is metric traversal. We just want to count how many odds we have in the metrics. How hard can it be? So the first thing is obviously we have to check row by row versus column by column. I don't think that this will surprise anyone. When we go row by row, we use the memory, the memory sequentially. So we just bring a memory line, read all of it, never see it again. You go to the next one, read all of it, never see it again, as fast as it can be. If you go column by column, we bring a cache line, read one value from it, scrap it. Go for the next one, read one value from it, scrap it. Read the next one, read one value from it, scrap it. Then we go back to the second column. So read the first cache line again, read one value from it, and scrap it. So I don't think that that's a huge surprise, but it does raise a question. Is column by column is the worst we can do? Obviously, by the fact that I asked the question, and it's not. Random is the worst we can do. And that raises two questions. The first one is why random is worse. Yeah. yeah, because it cannot predict. When I go column by column, I take the first cache line, read one value from it. And then you go, for example, for the 1001 cache line, read one, one value from it, and go, go, then go to the 2001 and read one value from it. And then the CPU says, I think I know what's going to be your next cache line. And it just brings me the next cache line and it has it ready for me. When I'm using random, it cannot know. So the prefetcher cannot help me. The other question that we may want to ask ourselves is why will I do it? When I traverse the matrix, it's obviously really no logic. But did you ever use set or list? That's what we will get. Did you use vector with pointers? Yes, the, ver the vector itself is consistent. It's contiguous, sorry. But on every cell, we'll have to just go to, the net, to the, an arbitrary location to see the object. So we actually do random a lot more frequently than we think. If anyone really could read the small read there, you'll notice that the, that the metric size that they used is 1,025 by 1,025. And I that it, you know that it's not a, a coincidence. 1,025 is just one more than 1,024, which is a power of two. So what will happen if I'll reduce the, the metrics to 1,024. We're doing less work. We should expect to see the same performance or maybe slightly better performance. And that's what we get. When we read column by column, yes, it's the same. But when we read call major, column by column, although we're doing less work, we still get much worse uh, performance. It's actually very close to the random. Yeah, it's again the cache line, because what happened in 1024, it's, I cho chose it because it's 
take the minimal usage of the cache. Remember that we said that each cache line can go into a small subset of caches, of cache slots. So this way, I'm running the first one, and then the next one has to go into the same section, and the th third one has to go into the same section, and each cell in the same, in the same, uh, in the same column would fit in the same uh, cache line, in the same section. So the prefetcher cannot really help us here. It has to reuse the whole ca the cache line over and over and over again. And indeed, we see that it's very, very close to the random. The greater the associativity, the greater the amount of slots in each section, the, the better the, the, the prefetcher can help us, but the overall will be slow. Yes? For this machine, it's uh, 64 bytes. Now, we want to go into multicore, and that would obviously add some other consideration that we want to take into account. It should be really easy. We just need to make sure we don't have data races, shouldn't we? Now, this is one of my all-time favorite examples. It first published like years back by Herb Saturn in Dr. Dobbs. And Everyone is coding in since then, so I might I copy it also. Ignore all this uh, code. What we see here is that we, first of all, we make an array on the size of the amount of threads that we want to spawn. Then we spawn all the threads. Each thread, what is going to do? All these small, smaller. Uh, lines of code, just calculate its chunk. Every time that it's in an odd number, it's updated its own cell in the array. When it's finished, it signals that it's finished, and then it just adds the array. There's no locks here, no, it's lock-free, weight-free, should be the best, shouldn't it? And the first reason that I really, really like this example is that most people that did not see this code will pass it code review. Very, very few people that I saw so far would not have passed this one code review. But that's the result. That is speed up. That's what Herb Saturn uh, published, and that's, I ran it uh, also, and the results are very, very similar. That is speed up, it means we take the time that it took us to complete, divided by the time it took a single thread to complete. So if it's one, it means that it took exactly the same time as, one, as it took one thread. And we see that until 15 or 16, one thread took longer time to complete than few threads. The maximum speed that we got is 40%. So if you look at two threads, it took almost 50% slower. So we're doing four times the amount of cycles than a single thread. But we're doing the, the same work. So we have a performance issue. So obviously, we use Perf. I'm a Linux user. I'm sure that Microsoft has some other tools that are just as good. And again, I'm lying because I don't really believe that. But what we see here is that this increment takes 75% of our CPU cycles. But it's just a simple increment. We had two loops, so we have at least another two increments. Why? Whenever a core wants to update its own cell, it has to have an excuse, exclusive ownership of the whole cache line. At this time, all the other cores have to hold, have to wait for this uh, core to finish. When this core finally finishes, the cache line has been invalidated. So we have to fetch it back from the memory. So practically, at any given time, only one core or any one, only one thread is actually working. And if you look here, the only speed up that we got is when we crossed the cache line size, when you go to 16 cores. I forgot to say, when I measured it, I didn't measure, it does not include the time of spawning the threads. That's just the actual work, the actual looping. 
So the resolution for this is also quite simple, and that's the second reason that I really, really love this example. We just add, an, add another counter. Update this counter. It's not shared with anyone. And then at the end, we just once set it to, the, to our vector, and everything else is the same. Could this make a difference? Well, obviously, yes, because otherwise I wouldn't have <laughs> put it. But that's the most beautiful two words in the, in the English language. Linear scalability. When I ran it, I didn't get quite so linear, but also we got 19 times as opposed to 1.4. I think that's quite impressive, and I love this example because it's so counterintuitive unless you know it. And the resolution is so uh, simple. Now, not only arrays are subjected to false sharing, it's called false sharing because I'm not really sharing anything, but I'm sharing the cache line. So not only arrays are subjected to it, heap allocation, global, statics, even from different compilation unit are also subjected to it. What we, will, what we need to have is like we need to have few cores that simultaneously access the same cache line and access it frequently, and at least one of them is a writer. Now let's look a bit about application, how we can write code that would be faster. So the first thing I want to talk about is cache oblivious algorithms. When we talk about cache oblivious algorithms, we don't mean that the algorithm is oblivious to the cache existence. It's, obliv it's oblivious to its characteristics. And we try to minimize the amount of cache misses that we have. Now, given that it's oblivious to the cache characteristics, if it's good for one layer of cache, obviously it would be very just as good for each other layer of cache. Cache-aware cache -aware algorithms, on the other hand, can outperform cache-oblivious algorithms, but they have to be tuned to the machine and to the cache level that we have. So if you, have, if you know that your application is going to run on one machine, and you know the cache uh, size, and you know all the cache characteristics, you might as well optimize for this machine. But if you write general code that needs to run on a different machine, that's not the solution. You may want to reach out for cache oblivious algorithms. When we want to analyze it, we'll still use the big O notation, but this time, our complexity is the amount of cache misses that we have. We also allow ourselves to idealize the cache model. We ignore cache hierarchies. We ignore the replacing policies. We assume that we have the best possible replacing agent, replacing uh, policy, that the cache line that would be evicted is the last one that we'll need. And we ignore associativity. We assume full associativity, which means that every cache line can go into each slot of the cache. It's quite easy to prove that still with all this uh, idealization that we, that, we allow, that we gave, we're still within constant order from realistic cache implementation. So let's look at an example. We have a sequence of number, and we want to find the greatest number that is less than x. We assume that we search this uh, sequence many times, so we don't really care and we ignore the preparation time. How should we store this sequence? So the first thing that everyone says is to sort it and to use binary search. Binary search will cost us log n comparisons. And given the distance, it's very close approximation that it will be log n cache misses. It's actually log n minus log b. But that's the order that we talk about, log n. We want to do something a bit better. So let's look at B3. We just need to set the B size to the cache line size. And it will require log base B of n steps in order to find the number. Given that B is the size of our cache line, we can align each node to cache line. And it will require log n divided by log B memory accesses which is the best we can hope for. But it's cache aware, and we need to know the size of B. 
So what we'll do instead is we'll use Van M. de Boas algorithm, or algorithm. I hope I didn't mispronounce his name too badly. A full description of this and full analysis, analysis of this is beyond the scope of this talk, so we'll intuitively analyze it and intuitively describe it. What we want to do is to set fully balanced tree with our numbers, then recursively divide it into two, cut it in the middle, and then store each subnode continuously in the memory and use this in order to search. So I said a lot of words and probably no one got any clue of what I'm talking about. So we have here a fully balanced binary tree and we just divide it in the middle into the top section and then into all the other children, all the other nodes. And we recursively do it. So we take one section of it and divide it again. And then we store each subnode continuously. So the top subnode is here continuously. The next one is also continuously. And also this whole subnode is continuous in the memory. And that's where the magic comes. Each section, each subtree is of size B or less because we just keep dividing it. So in order to bring it to cache, we have maximum of two cache, cache misses. The whole size of the tree is log n, and the size of each subtree is something between log b to log b divided by 2, log square root of b. Because either it fit, or I have to divide it again. So all that we need to know is how many sections, how many subtrees we visited till we found our value. So we have to visit log n, the size of the whole tree, divided by log b divided by 2, which is the size or the height of our section. So that gives us that we need 4 log n divided by log b memory accesses. Make some sense? No one says otherwise, so I'll assume that it's fine. So it's a lot better than binary, but the binary search. It's not as good as B3. But it's cache oblivious. So it will adopt to any cache size. It plays well with different memory hierarchies. Most of the cache oblivious algorithms are divided in concur. We'll just keep dividing our problem until it fits in their cache line. Let's look at this class. We have some sort of an object. It has a position, it has a speed, it has an arbitrary model, it has a name, and then it has some foo. Simple, something that we all wrote. Now let's look at this update function. Let's take time and do some calculation. Don't look for anything smart there, it's just to use some, uh, to use something. It's not anything smart. So what do you think is the most expensive operation that we'll do here? Square root. Let's look at it. I'm first loading foo, that's a cache miss, that's 200 cycles. Then I'm loading speed. It's on the same cache line, so it's three cycles. Then I'll multiply it and add, that's five cycles. I do it twice for pose one, another five cycles. Then I'm doing the square root about around 30 cycles. Then I fetch foo, it's another cash miss, another 200 cycles, and then I add f to foo, which is another cycle. Total 450 cycles. Can the compiler help us here? Only 50 cycles out of the whole 450 cycles are actual real work. The compiler is not allowed to rearrange our data, and it has very limited control about of free fetching and caching. So actually all the compiler's domain is those 50 cycles, which is not very much. I think that you all agree with me. So if we'll just move foo to speed, just below speed, it's now on the same cache line. So when we want to load it, we won't have cache miss. So if we'll come to analyze the new cost, it's all exactly the same, 
We just don't need the cash line, the cash miss. So we're down to 250 cycles. Yes? The question was, did I use perfect measure? No, it's intuitive. It's not, the, even the cycles are not uh, real uh, something, it's just approximations. But yes, this would be faster. That's definite. So that orange design in one sentence means that as the purpose of any program that we wrote is to take data from one uh, sort and to move it into, an, into another, transform that, transfer data from one form to another form, what we really want is to make continuously data pack chunks of memory that would be used consecutively. We want to group the data, not according to the object that they represent, but according to the usage. When the data is needed and the transformation that we're going to perform on it. So can we do better in this example? It's very likely that we'll run this update function in a loop. We have a vector of objects, and we just iterate through each one of them and update each one of them, right? So we'll take what I just said about data or design. If I'll just regroup the data according to the transformation, according to the update, I'll end up with this. I keep the object as it was. I just tear out the position data from it, and I place this in an object position class. Now let's analyze the new date, the new costs. Each cache line, a single cache line has multiple objects now. So the data of fetching the object is shared between several objects. So on average, fetching each object will cost us something like 40 cycles. So the total cost would be now 40 cycles for the fetching and another 50 cycles for the actual work, 90 cycles. So we started with 450 and then we ended up with 90. That's quite a good uh, optimization, I think. Quite similar, we have a container and it happens quite a lot that we need to operate on just subset of this container. We want to look for all the invalid objects for all the green uh, objects. So we look at the first object, look at a very small part of it, and then scrap it. Then look at the next one, look at another small part of it, scrap it. Then keep looking at each object, and then finally, maybe on object seven, we actually need the whole object. If I'm using pointers, yes, I'll have, uh, it will be packed, but I just gain another layer of indirection. So I'm going to the set to object pointer one, going to its location, look there at this small, at this small uh, part of the object, and then comes back to my container, so it's even worse. If I'm using booleans, it's very likely that I'm doing something wrong from performance point of view, because I'll bring the whole cache line and look at one bit from it. One bit out of 512 bits. So what we really want to do is just to tear out the key and point at this object. So I'm loading the key, and I'm loading everything that I need, and only when I need, I load the whole object. So I, don't, I only load what I'm gonna need. I'm not loading redundant data. This example is not about data cache invalidation, but about instruction cache invalidation. That's like day one in object-oriented programming, right? We have a vector of shapes. We iterate on this vector, and we just draw each one of them. We all written code like this. But vectors, but the squares is very likely to contain square, then circle, polygon, then another square, text, apple rectangle, and for each one of them, I need to fetch the draw instruction. So I'm going to the first one, bring the, the uh, draw of square, using it once, then scrap it, bring the instruction for a draw of circle, use it once, 
drop it again, going to polygon, draw it, then bring back a square, which is probably already been swapped out of the cache, and bring it back. So that's not very useful. Prefetching is obviously not possible here, because the CPU does, has no indication about what's going to be our next instruction. So what we'll do instead is we'll have a vector or a container of all the circles. We'll fetch the, the draw circle instructions once and we'll use it for all the circles. When we go to the next one, we know that we're not gonna need it, so I don't care that it would be swapped out. So I'm always using, so my cache is always hot. I'm always using the same instruction over and over again, and I'm only bringing the next one when I don't need it anymore. It may be not, not look as nice and as clean code, but it is much, much faster. If you'd have gone to Nimrod stock, that's runs now, one of the main optimization that I believe he's, he's going to talk about is something very similar. What they do a lot is even if they realize that they don't need to process a transaction anymore, they just keep processing it in order to keep the, their instruction cache hot. So you don't mind that they're using extra cycles for some transaction, as long as the transaction that they really want to process end to end would be as fast as possible. So they're paying extra just in order to keep the cache hot. As an added value of this, draw can now be devirtualized, so it obviously can be optimized even further. But we do lose the ordering here. If I need to order all, all of my shape in a certain order, I lost it here. Now, one of the biggest criticism about data-oriented design, it's because to write something like this is not, that may not be as nice and as pure. I have to say that the first time that I ever used data-oriented design, I didn't even know that it's called data-oriented design, and I did not use it for performance. We used to have a collection of uh, connections, and we need to, every now and then, to check all the connections if they're still valid. Now, as you can imagine, each connection had a lot, a lot, a lot of data. So I just store all the fields that are connected to the validity of the connection out because it was much easier for me to reason about it. So I didn't only gain the performance, I didn't even know that I'm gonna gain performance, I didn't think about it. The reason that I really wanted to do it is because sometimes sharing some fields makes my code actually easier to reason about because I'm, having, I'm confining the operation that I'm doing on the field into a smaller section of the code. Okay, we have three minutes. We can try to run into the next section really, really, really fast, or you can have questions. I'll just run through it really, really fast, and hopefully I'm gonna finish it with three minutes. I'll do it a lot faster than what I wanted to do it. So we all know the double, the double check uh, pattern, mainly from Singleton. We all know that it's broken. What you have to do in this instruction is allocate the memory, call the constructor, and assign to instance. If the compiler will allocate the memory, then assign it to instance, and only then call the constructor, a thread that comes in the middle can see uninitialized uh, memory. So what I thought, and I believe what most people thought, is okay, just, let's just add another temporary. The optimizer can see it and just go back to square one. It can just optimize it out. So this I didn't think about, but it's also a possibility to try to bring it to a larger scope. If I put it into static, compiler can still do it. If I put it in an, ex in an extern, still it can, it can see it, or you can just move the call to the constructor to the end, assign to both of them, and then assign it, and then call the constructor after the end. We can try to have another helping function in a different translation unit and then the compiler must assume that it may throw, so it must not inline it. But leak time optimization can kill this attempt. 
So what I thought about when I first started, like, years back, is, okay, let's just uh, volatile, uh, qualify it as volatile. And the lecturer at the time just waved her hand a bit and said, what, do we, what will we uh, have to uh, qualify as volatile? The pointer, the instance, and uh, mentioned the performance impact, but she couldn't really understand why it is wrong. And the reason is quite simple. An object is only volatile when it's fully constructed. So if I'm in lining here, the, the constructor, this line that's marked came from the, com from, the, uh, from, the from the constructor of Singleton, and it's not volatile, so the compiler can still reorder it. Yes, we can statically cast it into a uh, volatile, but I think that if I explain something, and if I convince you of something, that trying to outsmart the compiler is a really bad idea. And in C11, we have a resolution for that. We just place the compiler barrier here, right? Now the compiler is not allowed to reorder it, but what about CPU reordering? That's a game over. Nothing we can do about it. So we place a memory fence here. Is this good now? The compiler cannot reorder it. The CPU cannot reorder it. But instance is not atomic. So that's not good. So we'll just uh, make instance be atomic. That will work. That's co that, that code is safe. But it is uh, sequentially consistent. So it can be expensive. Sequentially consistent is the only memory barrier that will actually emit uh, any instruction in x86, for example. Can we do better? Well, instead of using full memory barrier, we can use acquire release notation. So this is still better. But do we really need the lock? This code is lock free. We load it with relax. If it's null, we just create another singleton. And we use compare exchange strong in order to check it. So if some other thread already succeeded in setting its, very, its uh, instance of singleton into instance, will fail and we delete our uh, instance. This way or the other, we just return instance.load. Okay, we have to use compare exchange strong, obviously, because we, we cannot afford to spur spuriously fail here. But if we go back to the scratching board, C11 stayed with regards to statics. If control enters declaration concurrently while variable is being initialized, the concurrent execution will wait for the completion of the initializer. So my singleton is now legal in C11. So when we look, we try to use our singleton and we shave a few cycles here and a few cycles there. We use really the heavy machinery of C++. But if we look, take a step back, and look at our problem, of the problem we're trying to solve with fresh eyes, we may come to something a lot, a lot simpler that's much easier to reason about, and it's also a lot, a lot faster. And that brings me to the point that I keep trying to make many times, that simpler code could be much faster. If you look at, at the problem that we're trying to, to to fix the problem you're trying to solve. And we look at it in new eyes, we may end up with simpler, more maintainable code that will be faster. But that's a topic for a whole new section. So we'll talk about it next year. Questions? Thank you.